Staying up to date on the myriad of subtopics in the defense domain can be a daunting task. Arms and systems are bought and sold every day, security situations can shift at any moment, and innovations in defense are under constant development. As Africa's leading defense news portal, Defense Web aims to bring you the latest in African defense, the South African National Defense Force, and defense company news. My name is Justin Cronier, and welcome to the Defense Web podcast. The European Union is stepping up its efforts in the UN arms embargo on Libya through the launch of a new common security and defense policy military operation in the Mediterranean. The European Union Council on 31st of March adopted a decision launching Operation EU Nafua Med Arini. Arini, Greek for peace, will have a core task to implement the UN arms embargo through the use of aerial, satellite and maritime assets. In particular, the mission will be able to carry out inspections on vessels on the high seas off the coast of Libya suspected to be carrying arms or related material to and from Libya in accordance with the UN Security Council Resolution 2292. A secondary task, EU Nafua Medarini will also monitor and gather information on illicit exports from Libya of petroleum, crude oil and refined petroleum products. It will also contribute to the capacity building and training of the Libyan Coast Guard and Navy and law enforcement tasks at sea and contribute to the disruption of the business model of human smuggling and trafficking networks through information gathering and patrolling by aircraft. The Ivory Coast has taken delivery of two second-hand MR-8P transport helicopters, which it plans to use to assist with coronavirus mitigation efforts. The aircraft were delivered to the Force Ariane de la Côte d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast Air Force, in mid-March and were seen transiting Palma de la Moca airport in Spain on 14th of March during their ferry flight to Abidjan. The helicopters will be operated by Group Ariane de Transport et la Téléazone, Airport Transport and Liaison Group, based at Abidjan Port Bouet Airport. 14 employees of Ukraine's Odyssey Aviation Plant have returned home from Uganda after appearing and upgrading six Ugandan training and combat aircraft. Yukabororon Prom on 28th of March said a team of experts from the Odyssey Aviation Plant was part of an international cooperation program at Gulu Air Base in Uganda, where they repaired and upgraded six Uganda Air Force L-39ZA jet aircraft under a contract concluded by the state's own Progress Specialized Foreign Trade Firm, which is part of Ikora Bron Prom. The team included pilots, engineers, and designers. Kapol Dagado province in northern Mozambique has seen a dramatic spark in tax in recent days including a hearts and minds operation by insurgents in the strategic coastal town of Makumboa de Paraya. The ISIS-inspired Al-Sunawal-Ajayat al attackers were met with little resistance, as there was only a handful of soldiers, some of them apparently asleep at the time of the invasion. The armed men burnt government property, including buildings and military assets, banks and cars, but did not seem to go on a large-scale killing spree, as they have done since the insurgency began over two years ago. The insurgents claim to have killed several members of the security forces, but local authorities have released, have not released, sorry, any official figures of casualties. Instead, the attackers distributed food and then left the village, with some local inhabitants cheering them on. Mozambique expert Joseph Hanlon, visiting senior fellow at the London School of Economics, says the insurgents seemingly have a new strategy to win over the local population while simultaneously clearing out the remote areas surrounding the towns and villages through their attacks. For decades, the local inhabitants have had very little government support. The recent failed resettlement of people to make way for the exploitation of mineral resources, including natural gas and rubies, has exacerbated discontent with the state. Thousands of people have lost their livelihoods in farming and fishing. As a result, some view the state, not the insurgents, as the enemy. Corruption is also rife and people resent the government for not redistributing what they see as their share of the region's mineral and resource wealth, Handlin told ISS today. That story comes from the Institute for Security Studies Africa. Also from Institutes of the Security Studies for Africa, South Africa's national state of disaster and associated lockdown in response to the COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented. It could have a significant impact on crime and public safety, both in the short and longer term. Although it's too early for definitive conclusions on the security impact of responses to the virus, media reports have cited instances elsewhere where restrictions on public movement have yielded some safety benefits. 
For example, between 16 and 22nd of March, crime in New York City has dropped by 17%, with similar figures from the Netherlands. This trend wasn't reported for all crime types, however. Vehicle theft skyrocketed by 52% in New York during this period. South Africa faces very different challenges to Western countries that have implemented lockdowns to prevent the spread of the virus. As one of the most unequal countries of Earth, as one of the most unequal countries on Earth, 30.4 million people, or, 50 per, or 56 percent of the population, live on 1,227 rand or less a month in 2019, while the top 10 percent of earners took home 65 of all income in the country. Millions of people live in single rooms and cramped conditions in informal settlements or crowded inner city buildings. They will struggle to make substantial adjustments to their lives to mitigate the spread of the virus. Being forced to stay indoors for weeks could result in hearts and tensions between people and households and between neighbors. Keeping men under lockdown could result in more domestic violence. At 36.4 per 100,000 people, South Africa has one of the worst murder rates. This is a result of a culture of violence, a toxic mix of poverty, inequality and unemployment, and cities that have retained apartheid-era urban design. These problems are exacerbated by chronic alcohol and drug abuse. Most murders result from conflict between young men who make up 81% of the 22,022 murder victims recorded by the police in 2018-19. One concern is that keeping men in their home under the lockdown with many unemployed or having just lost their jobs could result in more incidents of domestic violence and possibly even sexual and gender-based violence. Police Minister Becky Sele on the 5th of April clarified to the media that the South African Police Service had received 2,320 complaints of gender violence during the first week of lockdown. This is 37% higher than the weekly average for the 87,290 gender-based violence cases reported during 2019. The National Gender-Based Violence Command Center said they had tripled the usual number of calls. Research by the South African Medical Research Council found that 56% of female murder victims in South Africa were killed by their intimate partners. A related concern is that almost 45% of child murder victims die as a result of abuse or neglect often at the hands of their own mothers. The Guardian, citing police and activists, report that there is already evidence from other countries that lockdowns due to the virus have resulted in increased domestic violence. Because the lockdown is unprecedented, in South Africa and elsewhere, there is no clear evidence yet for its effect on crime and violence. It could even yield positive developments with regards to overall levels of interpersonal violence. Now this article from the Institute for Security Studies Africa goes on to suggest that alcohol ban in SA could reduce interpersonal violence but put those who are dependent on alcohol under stress. The article also suggests initially gangs and crime syndicates may be disrupted but will probably soon adjust. Two Russian Navy ships of the Baltic Fleet arrived in Table Bay Harbor on the 30th of March but all planned activities have been curtailed due to the COVID-19 lockdown. Whilst in port, the Euroslavishmi class guard ship, which is a frigate, Euroslav Madri and uh, Altai class replenishment oiler Yelna were under strict quarantine. Approval for their arrival was obtained prior to the establishment of the national states of disaster on the 15th of March 2020 due to the COVID-19 outbreak and subsequent 21-day lockdown commenced in South Africa on the morning of 27th March. Undertaking an anti-piracy deployment on the Indian Ocean, the two vessels were in the port for two days in order to take on fuel, fresh water, food and other supplies. It is understood that no formal activities with the South African Navy are to take place. In South African National Defence Force news, the Department of Defence and Military Veterans has called up members from the Reserve Force to complement their already deployed soldiers in the fight against the COVID-19 coronavirus. The call comes after President Cyril Ramaphosa deployed South African National Defence Force members to assist the country to fight the coronavirus pandemic. The move is in line with the National Disaster Management Act of 2002, Section 27, Subsection 2, which provides that the SANDF must release its personnel to a national organ of state for rendering of emergency services. Subsection 2 provides for the SANDF to assist with the movement of persons and goods to and from or within the disaster-stricken or threatened areas. It's apparently other policy or practice in the SA National Defence Force not to make public the names of deployed regiments and units, but surely this should not happen as 
when now a national state of disaster is in force. Since South Africans had their first taste of what is officially the coronavirus pandemic last month, from the Wuhan repatriation mission to the internal deployment of close to 3,000 military personnel, all they are told is soldiers and military medical personnel are involved. It is in the best interests of defense in a democracy and building both esprit de corps and pride in the country's military. Defense Web asked for the names of the units involved in the Wuhan mission. This was given short shift by the SANDF Corporate Communications Directorate with the brisk response that it is not policy to release the unit names when deployed in the interests of security. A similar response came from the SA Navy, the largest components of the SANDF, when asked for the names of the reserve force units called up to assist with the national lockdown. Given that 52 SA Army Reserve units and regiments underwent some name changes last August, the current situation provides an opportunity for at least some of them to be put into the public space. <laughs> The military ombud office in Centurion is operational and taking complaints, including those alleged excessive use of force by soldiers during the national state of disaster lockdown. This is confirmed by Democratic Alliance Shadow Minister of Defense and Military Veterans Gurbis Marais and retired General Vusi Masondo's office. Marais indicated earlier this week he would be taking the issue of soldiers going beyond reasonable measures to ensure lockdown regulations are adhered to. He today confirmed acknowledgement of this complaint by the Ombud. It was acknowledged by Masondo during an interview on Kaya FM. He confirmed the complaint would be investigated and it has been submitted to General Soli Shoke, Chief of the SA National Defence Force. I am happy there is no proactive response, said Marais. The issue of the illegal use of South African National Defence Force uniforms was again last week in public focus, after a woman was allegedly attacked in KwaZulu-Natal by people impersonating soldiers. A woman in her 70s was apparently attacked, raped and subsequently murdered in Sweetwater, KwaZulu-Natal during the national state of disaster lockdown by unknown attackers allegedly impersonating soldiers who claimed they were going around sanitizing homes. This was subsequently expanded to include police. There has been no official comment on the Sweetwater attack from either the SANDF or the SA Police Service. Secretary for Defence Dr. Sam Galube has not vacated his office in the Arms Corps building and will remain the senior civilian official in the Department of Defence until June. Galube's strategic statement in the General Information section of the 2019 DOD Annual Report indicated it would be the last he would contribute to. He was expected to leave at the end of December. This did not happen, and Defence Web was at the time informed that he would stay on until at least the end of March, as per an arrangement. The dates came and went, with no official announcement in regards to his successor. A Defence Web inquiry to the DoD brought the response, Galube is staying until June. Galube has been a senior civilian in the Department of Defense for more than eight years after a stint in the SA Military Health Service. Among tributes paid to retired General Constant Fulyun, who died 86 on Friday at his farm in Mpumalanga, is one from the current chief of the SA National Defense Force. He was well known as a soldier's soldier and was described by his contemporaries as an outstanding man and a disciplined soldier, General Sully Schalke said in a statement, adding he was always forthright and honest. In his tribute, the political party he founded, the Freedom Front Plus, said, as a soldier, he was highly respected among his peers and subordinates. He was a military leader who believed a general leads from the front and not from behind. He was sometimes criticized for this, but he earned the respect and admiration of his soldiers right down to grassroots levels for his approach. The medical components of the SA National Defence Force wants volunteers, and urgently, to boost the number of healthcare operatives in the ongoing battle to flatten the coronavirus infection curve. The SA Military Health Service is looking for registered medical doctors, 
professional nurses, enrolled nurses and auxiliary nurses, clinical associates and operational emergency care practitioners to join the uniform medical ranks on a part-time basis. Those interested candidates should contact the South African Military Health Services Director of Medicine at 012-367-9156. Director of Nursing at 012 367 9168. Director for Emergency Military Medical Care at 012 671 5005. This number is for EMSs with previous military service. And Director Military Health Reserve at 012 671 5153. When making contact, respondents must have ID and registration numbers on hand. South African Military Health Service doctors are keeping busy in the DRC. At the Composite Helicopter Unit in Goma, DRC, the South African Military Health Service has a Level 1 hospital. Defence Web had the opportunity to interview some of the doctors from that hospital. Our primary mandate is to do medical evacuation, like it's um, AMED stands for Aeromedical uh, Team Evacuation, yes. So that's what we are basically doing, um, moving patients from one uh, facility to the next. I'm from three military hospital in Blue I'm stationed here uh, in the DRC. I'm with AMED Team 1 at Goma. I've been here for three months, going for the fourth one now. Because we're moving patients that have been stabilized before, so it's different from doing a cassavec. Cassavec is when you're extracting patients from the bush, those ones who are fighting for us, you know. With us, we, 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 we're moving those that have been stabilized at level one. Um, those are the field hospitals, and then we have to move them to the next facility. Um, so, and we see trauma cases, we see medical cases, like the last one we did was a patient with a myocardial infarction. So we had to move that patient from um, one of the villages, Bukavu, to Entebbe, which is Uganda. And so far we've done, we're almost at 70, 70 medical evacuations. I haven't had the worst, but I've had my fears. You know, like when we have to move in at night and go and extract the patient from the surrounding villages, you know, so you sort of wonder of the security, uh, the flight is dark, you know, you, but you have a faith in your pilots and everything, but we also are getting security. We're being, um, before we can go in, they um, ensure that the place is secure before we can fly off. But that little fear is still there. <laughs> so, you don't have time. Yeah. And when the aircraft land, you scoop the patient, and you go. The other stuff you do them inside the aircraft. And it's, that is a very challenging thing to put up drapes, to listen to their heartbeats and everything. You can't hear anything in the aircraft. So you just have, you know, <laughs> to be on the ball. <laughs> but it has to be done. Yeah. I've been here for seven months. Yeah, but I started working in Benny. I worked in Bain for four months and then now I'm here in Goma. I think Goma is relatively stable, but the people in Beni, that's where they, that kind of action is. For me, the busiest month is when I was in Beni because I had an opportunity to work uh, both in Beni and in Goma. And Beni is the most volatile area. So we saw a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of patients. Of Sometimes you, you lose, you lose count. Okay. Uh, different type of, 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 of gunshot wound. Sometimes it's uh, injuries from bomb explosions, uh, gunshots, AKs. So it's different types of, 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 of gunshot wound. Sometimes we even assist small kids as young as six months uh, from machete wounds, uh, gunshot wounds. So we see locals as well. So it's, it's quite sad, but uh, it, it's a lifetime uh, experience. I've learned a lot. If, if I wasn't here in Congo, I don't think I was gonna experience uh, that at, at, at home in South Africa. 
Because in South Africa, we work in a hospital in city where everything is around you. But here it is quite different. You spend most of the time inside the aircraft. Some of the patients, you must resuscitate them inside the aircraft while the aircraft is flying. And it's, it's, it's a difficult working condition. We are in Goma, and then Beni is close to uh, Lake Edward. It's, it's in the north, close to the border of uh, Uganda. Okay. Uh, so some uh, the team that is in Beni sometimes evacuate they, they evacuate patient from the surrounding area, and then Goma team we go to Beni fetch patient, and then sometimes. We take some of the patients to Uganda or we take them to the eastern part of DRC, Kinshasa, depending on the severity of the case. If it's a case that needs a higher level of care, we send them to Uganda, level 4 hospital, or uh, Kinshasa, because we have level 4 in Uganda and level 4 in, in, in Kinshasa. Some of the cases, we take them to level 3 here in Goma, and if it's a um, a Congolese uh, FRDC soldier, we take them to their level three, which is in, in Goma. Some of them we take them to level four in Kinshasa. Because when I was in Beni, uh, they woke me up at around 1 a.m. We had to go and evacuate patients in a village at Bigado. The area was quite uh, volatile. Uh, we left uh, Beni to Bigado in some of the Tanzanian, uh, with the Tanzanian platoon, we had to evacuate uh, WHO members, uh, staff staff members who were shot. Uh, the Ebola treatment center was attacked, so we had to go to Uganda and evacuate those patients. I'm just proud of my team, myself, and my country. This is a life-changing experience. Very, very and in company news, Dracum International has begun flying supersonic radar-equipped Mirage F-1M fighters to support U.S. Air Force combat training at Nellis Air Force Base after the aircraft were returned to service by Paramount Aerospace Systems. The fully modernized Mirage F-1Ms, predominantly flown by the Spanish Air Force in the past, now challenge U.S. and coalition fourth and fifth generation fighters over the scars of the Nevada test and training range and the development of war fighters' tactics, techniques, and procedures, Draken International said on 22nd of March. DuPont Defense, in collaboration with Bulletproofing Technology, examined South African developments in body armor during a recent symposium in Pretoria, highlighting the capabilities of the local industry. Alan Chinhan Damba, regional segment leader at DuPont Protection Solutions, started off with an overview of some of the latest developments in body armor. Alan Chinhan Damba, regional segment leader at DuPont Protection Solutions, started off with an overview of some of the latest developments in body armor, including Tesla and polyethylene armor for lightweight helmets, plate shields and vehicle armor, ceramics and other materials such as multi-axial fabrics. He said DuPont has 5 million soldiers and law enforcement personnel protected by its Kevlar and other products, with customers in 50 countries around the world. In Africa, this includes South Africa, Angola, and Nigeria. Dion Duplessis, Managing Director at Bulletproofing Technologies, looked at developments in hard armoring. He said it is important to know which threats to protect against and that one should look at bulletproofing types rather than energy levels. In South Africa, 75% of illegal firearms are handguns, with the majority of these being .38 and 9mm calibers. Shotguns are almost negligible in numerical terms along with hunting rifles. Assault rifles pose a big threat. With 5.56mm calibre, the most common at 15% of illegally used firearms. AK-47s used to be more common, but are not so anymore, with about 5% of illegal firearms being accounted for by the AK-47 series. Of the 5.56 bullets, Duplessis said the most dangerous type is the SS-109 lead bullet with the steel tip that is easily able to penetrate armor. The normal lead core struggles to penetrate a Kevlar helmet. 
The 7.62 by 39 millimeter AK-47 ammunition, commonly used in South Africa, has a mild steel core which gives it high penetration and is best stopped by steel, composite ceramic and only the very newest types of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene armor. Duplicis explained that there are three main body armor concepts. Standalone, the plate provides total protection. Stop in plate, plates used in conjunction with stop with soft armor behind the plate. And lightweight composite plates used to upgrade the protection level of soft armor jackets to protect against rifle attack. Soft armor stops bullets by absorbing energy, while hard armor plates break up or stop bullets totally. Ceramic armor usually breaks bullets, with another material layered behind the ceramic to absorb the energy. Until 1980, Hard armor was typically armored steel or even titanium and aluminium. But although effective and cost effective, steel is heavy and can't stop armor piercing rounds at reasonable weights. Composite armor, ceramic and fibrous materials bounded together, offer reasonable weights but require advanced technology to produce, need to be handled with care and are more expensive. Fibrous composite armor offers low weight, good multi-shot resistance and little spalling, but are expensive and cannot stop armor piercing bullets. Duplicis said new technologies are emerging such as boron carbide plates. Duplicis said new technologies are emerging such as boron carbon plates, nanomaterials, energy absorbing materials and new fiber types. Armor is also becoming more comfortable and flexible for better movement. Duplicis caution that body armor is the last line of defense and does not make the wearer a superman. When considering all angles, a bullet resistant jacket only protects 10% of a person. He added that body armor is unfortunately often not designed to be comfortable to wear and this causes a lot of people to take it off prematurely. Bulletproofing Technologies is one of the world's leading manufacturers of body armor plates and a major supplier of vehicle armor and body armor plates. It has three business lines. Body armor, vehicle armor, and special armor. Vehicle armor accounts for 45% of the company's turnover and usually comprises ceramics, GRP, polymers, etc. Four military vehicles, ships, and aircraft. BPT completes 300 to 500 vehicle armor sets a year and 70,000 to 150 body armor plates a year. The company has made 1.3 billion body armor plates to date. The company recently invested 15 million rand in polyethylene presses for the manufacture of composite armor. On 27th of March, the first day of the 21 day coronavirus lockdown in South Africa, Rain Metal Denal Munition donated 6,000 litres of hand sanitizer to the South African National Defence Force. This was done together with Chemtol, an RDM partner, to support the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic in South Africa. It is RDM's responsibility as an integral part of the national security system to stand by our soldiers and policemen said REM CEO Jan Patrick Helmson. REM is also producing aluminium sulfate, an essential ingredient to keep water clean and drinkable and is currently supplying the chemical compound to the city of Cape Town. RDM has called on other businesses and individuals to offer their support and contribute to the relief measures in any way possible. Bruiser 112 testing going smoothly. Bruiser Tech is making swift progress on the blast trials of its Bruiser 112 armoured personnel carrier, with landmine and improvised explosive device testing carried out at the CSIR, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Researchers facilities at Bardofontein. The first test was 50 kgs of TNT placed 5 metres away from the vehicle. The damage was superficial and the risk of injuries was recorded as being less than 10%. The second test was 8 kgs of TNT placed under the rear right wheel. The damage was superficial 
and the risk of injury again was recorded at being less than 10%. One more blast test will soon take place to simulate a landmine detonating under the hull of the vehicle. Once completed, the Bruiser 112 will meet NATO standards for armored personnel carriers. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, our daily and weekly newsletter, and our other social media platforms if you enjoyed the podcast. Leave your comments below. Thank you for watching. Stay safe during this lockdown, and we'll see you next week.